Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. We have Vice Chair Carter, we have uh, Commissioner Bill Lashley, we have Commissioner Boswell, and we have Commissioner Sutton. So if you would please join me in an invocation, if you care to pray with me, you are welcome to. If you don't care to, then please do not. Um, for my prayer for the invocation today, I wanted to share a prayer that was given by President Lincoln uh, in uh, March. 1861. Um, so, if you uh, aren't a person of prayer, if you want to reflect on the historical significance of this prayer, then you're welcome to do that. Almighty God, who has given us this good land for our heritage, we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will. Bless our land with honorable ministry, sound learning, and pure manners. Save us from violence, discord, and confusion, from pride and arrogance, and from every evil way. Defend our liberties and fashion into one united people, the multitude brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues. Endow with thy spirit of wisdom those whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government that there may be justice and peace at home, and that through obedience to thy law, we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth. In time of prosperity, fill our hearts with thankfulness, and in the day of trouble, suffer not our trust in thee to fail, all of which we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 If you would uh, join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge, I pledge allegiance. allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, the first item on our agenda is public speakers for our items which are agenda related. Uh, today we have we do not have the use of our overflow room, which we call an overflow room. Other people call it a courtroom, <laughs> and the court system is using that today for uh, court business. And so we are limited in our space, and so uh, we have the opportunity for people to call in. They had to sign up to either call in or the clerk will call them or they could have uh, submitted email comments, written comments to be read. So Madam Clerk, uh, do you have anybody to call? Yes, first we have Melvin King of Mevin. Great, you call Mr. King. Mr. King? Yes? You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. Hi, Mr. King. Okay. Hi, Mr. King. This is Amy Gailey. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. Um, you may begin your uh, public comment when you're ready. Yeah. Go ahead. Is everybody there? Yes, sir. We can all hear you. All right. Am I ready to start? Please do. Crank it up. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. The first thing, can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. We sure can. 
Is everybody there? Everybody is here. Okay. Well, the first thing I'd like to say is how dare people come to Alamance County and protest our sheriff and try to tell us that our sheriff needs to resign. These protesters don't understand that the only thing that's protecting them is the police here in the county. And if you look around, I think Alamance County is very fortunate to have Terry Johnson as our sheriff. There's no burned out buildings, no broken windows and stores, no cars burned in the streets. And I just, I just don't think people from other locations need to come here and tell us who our, our sheriff needs to be. I think we're very fortunate to have Terry Johnson. As, as far as the monument is concerned, that monument needs to stay exactly where it is now. These people, they want to tear down all of our monuments and take our history out of the school books are wanting to overthrow our government. And we could wind up like Cuba, Venezuela, China, and Russia. People died by the thousands in Russia because the government was trying to overthrow, overthrow and do away with their history. And they're trying to do the same thing in this country. The young Confederate soldier on that monument is descriptive of my great grandfather who was joined the 6th Regiment of Alamance County at the age of 18. He was wounded and captured and confined at Point Lookout in Merlin and he was released in a prisoner exchange and was with General Lee when they surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse. He came back home and started running the family farm. Slaves were freed and a lot of them had no place to live, nowhere to go. He took some slaves in his farm and gave them a place to live. They ate from the same food that the King family did. Their eggs came from the same hen house. The milk came from the same cows. And they had a place to live. Now, Sam, you'll understand this. This is one of those people that turned out to be sharecroppers and tenant farmers. When my great-grandfather died, he had one daughter and she inherited the farm. She lived on Harris Street in Burlington. Her Ms. husband was Sid Horn. He run the shoe shop. Mr. King? The shoe store. Mr. King? Well, ain't many couldn't farm. Mr. So King? She had to have somebody Ms. to do Mr. it. Mr. King? Yes. Uh, Mr. King, uh, your three minutes for your public comment are over. So if you wanted to have a sentence to wind things up, that would be appropriate. So what? Can you tell him? Repeat it, Tori. Three? I don't think he can hear. Your three minutes. I'm having a, your, I'm having a hard time understanding you. Your three minutes to speak is up. Do you want to go ahead and wrap it up? Sure. Well, thank you for letting me take the opportunity to do this. Great. Thank you. And I thank you for the job y'all are doing. Thank you, Mr. King. We appreciate that. Thank you for calling. Um, is there another person to call? Yes. Next is Azure Walker Roberson. I'm sorry, I couldn't Brian. hear that. Azure Brian. Walker Roberson.
Roberson, you're connected to the Can county commissioners meeting. Good morning, Spectrum News. Oh. Good morning, ma'am. This is Amy Gailey, the chair. Uh, you may begin your public comment when you're ready. Okay, thank you, and good morning. My name is Azure Walker Roberson, and I'm a resident of, of Brown, North Carolina. I'm speaking in support of the results of the People's Referendum on August 15th. Nearly 2,000 residents voted, and of that number, over two thirds of the vote support one removing the Confederate monument from outside the courthouse, and two, repealing the 287G warrant, surface, officer program in the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. Those voting represented all corners of the county, all ages, and all walks of life. We are your constituents, and duty to your office requires that you listen to us. It is no accident that the Confederate monument sits on the same site where Wyatt Outlaw was, was lynched by the KKK, and that the historical context of Alamance County's willing participation in the Confederate War has been unjustly conflated. The vote to remain in the Union was 1,114 versus 254 to secede. According to Alamance County's own website, the fact that the statute stands before a symbol of justice exacerbates all injustices historically expressed towards people and indigenous people, <laughs> black and indigenous people of color, and continues to represent racism and encourage hatred and oppression of our friends and family in Alamance County. I ask you, commissioners, respectfully, to call for a vote on removing the monument. Our community considers the monument and 287G program together because they both degrade the safety and cohesion of our community. Sheriff Johnson enacted the 287G program without input from the community or from the county commissioners. This is not a transparent process. It puts our community at risk by creating distrust between the community and law enforcement. As our elected representative, we ask you to work with Sheriff Johnson to repeal the 287G program People want to have a say in the, the decisions that shape the present and future of Alamance County. <clears throat> As an elected official and community leader, I urge you to listen to your constituents and act on these matters at the next county commissioner's meeting. Thank you for letting me speak this morning. And thank you for uh, calling in. We are glad that uh, people take advantage of that opportunity when it's available. Hope you have a good day. Thank you. Okay, do we have any others? That is it for that, Madam Chair. Okay, do we have any uh, written comments? Um, not on agenda items, only the public hearing. Okay, thank you. <coughs> then the public speaker time is over. Do we have any commissioner responses today? I'd like to respond to Melvin at the price of being ridiculed, ostracized, and called names, as well as other. Melvin, if you can hear me, I want you to call me. I believe my great-grandfather and your great-grandfather were together because my great-grandfather went in Company I or Regiment A, Company I, whatever, and I would like to talk to you about it. But uh, thank you for calling. Okay. Anybody else? Just one comment about the putting the uh, monument on a ballot. We checked, and the monument can't be put on a ballot. And I've asked um, Clyde Albright to make a comment to that effect. That is correct. That is not something that is, can be the subject of a referendum under North Carolina law. And also, um, I saw that another county had floated the idea of having a um, local bill giving them the ability to have a referendum on it, and uh, the legislature's adjourned, and there's not going to be any bills. And um, at the time that that was raised a few months ago, they had adjourned for the per with the uh, opportunity to come back to consider specific types of bills. COVID relief and appointments to different commissions and um, 
because of the way that the General Assembly does business, it was not possible to get a local bill through on that issue this year. I spoke with uh, with uh, Representative Rydell, and he did some research on it and said that the earliest that approval for putting this item on the ballot could be implemented would be in 2021 and during that session. And because that, that type of a ballot issue is re requires all precincts to be open, the earliest it could be put up for a vote on the ballot would be 2022. Right, probably the primary. Mm. Primary 2022. Okay, any other responses? If not, let's move forward. Uh, the next item is approval of the agenda. I move that we approve the agenda. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? The next item is the approval of the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. second. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, next item up is a public hearing on the solar energy system ordinance. We would be seeking a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. Second. Commissioner Lashley has made a motion to open the public hearing and Commissioner Carter has made a second. Uh, if there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, we had to have sign-ups in advance for the public hearing, and I believe we have three people or organizations or mm -hmm. entities which have requested to be called for the public hearing. Yes, Madam Chair, we had one written. Um, we had one um, written submission and three requested callbacks. So okay. Gina. Let's do the calls first, please. Okay. The first person is Mike Fox with Tuggle Duggins. Hey, Mr. Fox, this is a Chair Gailey. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Well, you were connected with the Alamance County Board of Commissioners meeting. We are on the public hearing for the Solar Energy System Ordinance. And you may understand you have a public comment to make. Great. Thank you very much. You may begin at any time. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to your staff and your planning board. They've done a great job in working on this ordinance. And this ordinance will be a great improvement for both uh, the solar industry that's interested in growing in Alamance County and also for your citizens in terms of understanding what solar is and protecting uh, the view shed and uh, property values, etc. Um, we think that the pulling out of the solar ordinance from the Hydo ordinance is the right thing to do, and they've done a great job with it. We had originally submitted two different comments uh, to be considered at the planning board. They took care of one, and so there's one left that we'd like to ask your board to consider changing, and that is the requirement in section six, um, article, um, the section six yes of um, article three I think that's article no I'm sorry section six of article four where it requires the renewal of uh, the solar operating permit every three years and it specifically states that uh, the uh, permit shall expire um, and I think the objection, I'm sorry, the, the objective and the goal from the planning board was to ensure that these solar operations get inspected every three years, which we're fully supportive of. Of course, the county has the ability to inspect uh, at any time. Uh, and if there are any deficiencies or anything, they have to, they can give notice that the solar operations have to fix them or they risk losing their permit. 
but we feel that the inspection can be accomplished without the permit actually expiring. And the reason that this causes a problem for the solar industry is is that when they do these projects, they are almost all financed in some way by a financial institution, a bank, or some other entity that uh, is in the financing business. And when they go to do their due diligence on whether they're going to loan tens of millions of dollars to a company to build a solar farm, but it's going to be in operation for 25 or 30 years, it causes a real problem when they look and they see that the permit's going to expire in three years and then have to be renewed. And you don't ever want to make your banker nervous. So um, <laughs> we're asking to try to have another method of getting those inspections. We've submitted some proposed language to Ms. Cottle uh, to be considered that would essentially, instead of the permit expiring and then having to be renewed, it would require a side inspection. Uh, once every three years, uh, whatever fee there was, uh, the solar companies would be glad to pay. It's not an this is not an issue over the fee at all. Um, and then, obviously, if there's any deficiencies, those would need to be fixed, uh, or the permit would be at risk. If there are no deficiencies, then you just move on and mark the calendar for the next uh, three-year inspection. We feel like that accomplishes the goals that the, the county and the planning board are trying to achieve in a way that does not make it harder for the solar industry to come in and finance their projects and, and build good projects in Alamance County that add to your tax base. So that's our, uh, our request and there are a couple other folks from the industry who are, uh, who are I think, going to speak and give a little more detail, but we would appreciate your consideration of, uh, of this change to the ordinance. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Fox, for that comment. We appreciate it. Thank you for calling in. Thank you all very much for this consideration. All right, next we have Sam Judd with Strata Solar. How do you spell his last name? S-T-R-A-T-A. -A. Thank you. This is Amy. This is Chair Amy Gailey from the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Can you hear me? I, I can hear you, yes. Great. Well, we were connected with the meeting. I understand that you wanted to be heard um, regarding the solar energy system ordinance in our public hearing. Right, correct. Okay, you may start at any time. Okay. Um, I, is, is Mike Fox on? Uh, Mr. Fox has already submitted his public comment. I I got you. Okay, okay. Um, well, I I think um, Mike might have summed things up uh, pretty well. Um, just just by way of introduction, my name is Sam Judd. Um, I'm with Strata Solar. We're based out of uh, Durham, North Carolina, and we're uh, one of the biggest solar developers in the state. It's not the largest. Um, we've got about 400 employees in Durham and. We built um, upwards of 100 solar farms in, in North Carolina, most of the 30 to, to 50 acre variety, um, which nowadays is considered pretty small as they're getting bigger and bigger. But um, at any rate, uh, we've done quite a few. And uh, I, you know, I, I wanted to comment on the on the draft uh, solar ordinance. Um, so uh, section six where it says SES permit renewal required. Um, 
We think this this section where it says SES permits issued under this ordinance are valid for a period of three years and shall automatically expire unless renewed. Um, we think this section is going to be a problem during um, project financing where we're getting a, a looking for uh, financing partners. Um, it's just it, the way it reads. It, it you know. It, they're going to think, well, you know, the, the developer, whoever is owning and operating the project, even if they do everything right, you know, the permit could be revoked, um, you know, during this time. Uh, and, uh, you know, we understand the concern and, uh, you know, we'd be happy if to, to have the, the project um, inspected every three years. And if, you know, if the buffer isn't up to code or up to, up to snuff or, you know, if, if the project isn't being maintained, then um, of course it would be subject to revocation, you know, for the terms of the ordinance. But just just the language in here is gonna be really hard to uh, to swallow for um, financing parties. Um, I, I spoke with one of our attorneys here who handles financing transactions and his, his description was it's, uh, this could be a big issue. So, um, yeah, we have concerns with that section, really, um, that, that language there. And we would propose, I, I guess, that, um, you know, every three years, uh, the, the project would be subject to an inspection. Um, and if the project is in compliance with the code, you know, the, the permit could be subject to revocation for the terms of the ordinance. Okay, is that the end of your comment? Is that the That's end? That's it, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right, well, great. Well, thank you very much for uh, participating in that. Have, have Absolutely. You have, have a good day. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Okay. Next is Carson Tartrader with Carolina Solar Energy. <laughs> Good morning, uh, Carson. This is Chair Amy Daly from the Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Hi, Chair Daly. Yes, good morning. I can. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Well, you're connected with the um, County Commissioner meeting this morning, and we are having the public hearing on the Solar Energy System Ordinance. And I understand that you had a public comment that you wanted to make. Great, yes. Um, I have one question. I don't know if you can answer questions, but is the vote on the ordinance today or is that going to be at a later meeting? The vote on the ordinance, if somebody makes a motion, we can vote on it today. Okay, um, thank you. And um, so we, um, Strata Solar and my company, Carolina Solar Energy, have been working with Mike Fox. So Mike comments at the uh, top of the public comments represented uh, my uh, uh, comments as well. Um, and Mike mentioned that the specific language that we were hoping for changes in this section six regarding the three year expiration, um, he had sent that to Tanya Cattle. So I don't know if that's available today, but that was the particular language that if there is a vote today, um, we hope it's available to be voted on. Um, so we can resend that if needed, um, but we have just written it out as the, the new language to uh, Mike's point and Sam's point. Just changes it from a three-year expiration automatically um, to a three-year inspection with, ex with expiration if the inspection results in issues that are not cured. Um, so it's, it's kind of just a tweak to make it a little bit less, um, the language less worrisome for our financing. So that's, that's the same comment that my company has. Um, I've been to speak there in person a few times on the solar ordinance. Some of the landowners uh, that our company is involved with in Alamance County have been there to speak as your constituents. Um, as Mike and Sam said, we're very grateful to Alamance County for all the thought that you and your staff have put into the solar ordinance. And um, with that one change, 
we think we'll be able to move forward with our future project in Alamance County. And we are, again, very, very grateful for all the time and consideration and thought you all uh, and the planning staff and the planning board have put in. So that, that's the end of my comments. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. And thank you for um, calling in and for your comment. <clears throat> have a good day. Do we have any others? Yes, Madam Chair. We have one online submission by Colin Connell of Medvin, and his comments are following. Based on the description of the proposed solar farm ordinance provided in the Alamance News of Thursday, August 26th, as a resident of Alamance County, I support the proposed rule change. The new ordinance recognizes that solar energy is unique among industrial development in that it produces neither noise, nor emissions, nor traffic, nor any other emissions. The ordinance recognizes the potential for decommissioned solar panels to present a toxic waste disposal problem and requires applicants to address this. The cost effectiveness of solar energy is increasing at incredible speed. The cost of panels and batteries has dropped off faster than anyone expected over the last five years. A thriving solar presence would bring high-tech maintenance and installation jobs to the area. Although the community <coughs> may consider solar a niche application, and although Alamance residents may find the installations ugly at the moment, in the long run, the energy and environmental needs of Alamance County will be best served by encouraging the solar industry wherever development rules permit. And that is all the comments I have to Great. Thank you. Um, and I don't believe there's anybody present in the room who is here to make a public comment on the solar ordinance but just to be sure I'll ask is there anybody present who wants to be heard in the public hearing and seeing that nobody has come forward um, that would be the end of the people seeking to be heard so do we have any uh, motion to close the public hearing I move second we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell to close the public hearing if there's no objection, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <clears throat> okay. Um, Tanya Cattle is our planning director. If you want to come up and uh, tell us about the ordinance, and then we'll uh, address the things that we heard in the comments. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Oh, good. So y'all have seen the draft of the ordinance. We did a small presentation at the last meeting about the ordinance. This ordinance will just pull language out of the HIDO that specifically speaks to solar energy. We will come behind this when this is resolved and touch up the HIDO to pull it out so it stands alone in this one ordinance. There's a little language at the end and it does some revocation from HIDO so immediately upon approval it does exempt it from the HIDO but we'll do the touch up too. Uh, the, the ordinance went through uh, subcommittee and planning from the planning board to come up with the language. Uh, myself and Ben from Legal sat in on it. Started with a base from the state kind of generic ordinance and we added in specific elements, county language, pulled some language from the HIDO that made sense to keep. Uh, so some of the things that you haven't seen in other ordinance really probably came from that template that the state had put together for uh, local jurisdictions to start from. Uh, you, you've heard a few comments from solar industry. We did expect that. We have worked with them throughout the project, invited them in. We've had YouTube meetings and a loud response to that during the process to make sure that we're not too far off on what expectations were. You've heard the one comment about the renewals. Do have lang language that was sent um, over the holiday to me from them in respect to the renewal process. I will say this has been brought up probably two or three times to planning board and subcommittee about wanting to pull that renewal out as a board, they decided that they weren't comfortable with that. They're more comfortable with this renewal process. It sits exactly the same as the HIDO renewal process, keeps some consistency across the board of all of our ordinances. And they feel like there is an obligation to the industry to come back to us to get their renewal straight and make sure that they're in compliance with us. 
so that isn't arbitrary that was discussed more than once to be sure that board wanted to keep this in there well, I can tell you from a finance perspective that would create some heartburn for a lender having done that I'm sure Tim can agree that uh, when you're making a loan that typically is going to be a commercial loan might have a five-year matur maturity with a refinance option with a 180 year amortization or something like 180 month amortization for a project of this size um, having a three-year expiration on your lot on your um, permit could create some heartburn from a lender's perspective because you you don't want to own a as a lender the bank doesn't want to own a anybody's business um, um, I can see that causing some real problems for I can, I can see that county. could be a problem. Yeah, that would definitely be a problem. I think the word expiration in mm -hmm. that whole thing is where the problem is. That's exactly right. When, when something it. expires, it does not give you an assurance that that's going to continue on. Um, it's kind of like you jump through the hoops to start with, but now it's time to jump through them again. Is there not a way we can revise that a little bit to say, at three years they will be re-inspected and provided they've done what they're supposed to you could say sure. they continue yeah i, I like it's that a idea. continuance instead of an uh, so expiration there's specific language at the beginning of that section <coughs> that he had called out and i believe it's article 4 section 6 and it says the our version of it is ses permits issued under the ordinance are valid for a period of let's see here so where are you three now? years uh, article 4 relief section yeah. 6 well, that's where I am yeah. um, for three years and shall automatically expire unless renewed that's the language probably that they're most called up on uh, you really don't see the expired word again well automatically expire and, unless and renewed. automatically expire to me says they're gonna shut it down I mean I've got a building license and at the end of the year they say it expires so this is the same language right. that we have in the high uh, Just that's where that came from. So it's of course up to this board how your pleasure on what that wording yeah. should be. But that I believe is what the concern is. Well, what's the um, language that was submitted by For Mr. Fox? what Mr. Fox submitted, he says SES permits issued under this ordinance and we're striking out are valid for a period of, and he says shall be subject to a site inspection the SES site inspection once every three years. That's the end of that. To continue. Mm -hmm. That's what and then he went into renewal fees, site visit requirement, and adjusted some language to copy. And Do you have a it. copy of that too? I have just one copy, yeah. I did not realize he hadn't sent that to you. No, he <laughs> Because it came in over the weekend. How about, um, you want to make a copy? Yeah, Clyde needs one of those too to look at. I mean, you could use language something to the effect of shall shall be renewed subject to a satisfactory inspection. Yeah, I, yeah, I think at that's at the end of three years versus mm -hmm. shall expire automatically expire. Yeah, yeah, that's the same thing in real estate. Mm -hmm. If you uh, you can't get something refinanced after five years, you can brought if you're selling a home, it's a problem. In the same way with uh, this situation here. <clears throat> well, that kind of brings back to an issue in the Hido. I don't, didn't recall that language like that, but in the Hido, if it's limiting, if, if the licenses are expiring at the end of three years, we may be putting somebody that's doing a development in the same issue if they're trying to get financing and their, their uh, license is automatically set to expire. Well, they didn't. We had the industry, the solar industry, has specifically come right. up to us and address this. We right. didn't hear the same concerns from other industries with the Hydo. Um, <coughs> Mr. Sutton, did you have anything you wanted to say? Well, I'm not going to lie to you. I don't know that much about it, too. What are the pros and the cons of doing what or the ordinance stands now versus going to what the ordinance proposes now? I'll let me and let me say that. Uh, see if I can get an answer on that. And Thank you. vaguely, I had heard or thought I saw or whatever 
that there were some issues about solar farms and, and that they weren't as popular for what they how they used to be or whatever. I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying that, you know, and if you if you go here and, and look up some of these articles, I mean, the Chicago Time, uh, Tribune, the New York Times, the Washington uh, Washington Times, they're writing several articles that there are some issues with solar farms and their proclivity or whatever. I mean, what? And, and again, I'm a, I'm I don't help me, educate me a little bit. I mean, are we? Is there a downturn on solar farms uh, as far as how they're being viewed by uh, scientists and or environmentalists? Uh, for instance, uh, you've been a farmer, uh, you know, I saw a big article here that it was affecting farmland and so forth, or some people were thinking that it was. I'm not trying to knock down solar farms, but I just, I don't, I need more information myself to see if we've explored it properly and or What's the recommendation, and, and, and Brian, your recommendations, county manager, uh, what we should do as well. Um, can, can we wrap all that up into some type of discussion? Let me start with the first part, the pros and cons of the language being proposed. Uh, like I said, the boards, were, the subcommittee and the planning board were not in favor of making this change. Uh, I think if a change is looked at, some of the language in what's being proposed is to put the burden on the county to go after the companies for the renewal. We had done it the opposite direction of the companies are responsible for renewing their own permit, not the county going after them kind of thing or sending everything out. Uh, pros, I guess, are that the industry has a little bit more ease to getting financing, getting projects within Alamance County. The con for us is as the language is written, it puts more burden on staff to um, take care of the actual normal process and who was opposed to it at our level well no we're not really opposed to it but the language of bringing it in um, to the this county we were responsible for initiating those inspections upon three years as opposed to the applicant initiating that in three years okay forgive me I might have missed or, or, or induced into what you said did you say somebody was voted was against the ordinance been changed uh, at our level planning um, or the planning board planning and the board. subcommittee specifically did not change this language when mr. Fox came to them <coughs> originally during their meetings because they didn't feel like this was a good change for the county that we need they felt like they needed more teeth than just the enforcement part that this gave more teeth to the county to make sure a group is in compliance and doing what they need to with the county if I may have uh, I think Mr. Sutton, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he's asking, what do you think? I think he's asking, what is the well, yeah, staff I mean, I, I say wanna, about what do you say? <laughs> what do you say, Tony? <laughs> um, I could go, per personally, I could go either way, and that's what I told the board um, when they were having this discussion. I don't want the burden on the county because we have enough things that we keep up with, right? It would, to me, be more um, on the permit holder to be responsible to come in and renew their permits. Uh, I can do a site inspection anytime. Anytime I have a complaint, I go out. So I have those enforcement abilities already in the ordinance. This being every three years, that just guarantees me that whether I have a problem or not, I'm going to lock that property every three years. That's either with a site inspection or renewal, kind of calling it something that equals the same to me. I'm still going out and I'm still going to issue uh, an approval if I go out and so everything's I, good. I, I'm a little confused. You still got to go out every three years, no matter. They're still proposing the site inspection. Yes. Yes, you still got to do that. Mm -hmm. So it's just the revocation of the permit. If I go through an enforce, enforcement type action, there's a lot of time built into that to give them the opportunity to fix something if I find something wrong. Right. This allows me to revoke much more quickly if we have a problem. How many solar farms do we have in the county? You know, I believe we have about a dozen approved. We don't have that many in the ground. I, I'm just kind of putting a burden of how, how much more burden is that to the county staff? Uh, once every three years, not too bad. Okay. Um, That's, yeah. Depends on how many more we get. We've gotten a lot of interest <coughs> in the Hido right, um, sort of be rewritten, so I don't know exactly what more we'll have. I think I've probably got three kind of in the background waiting to see what's going to happen with this ordinance to submit an application. So basically we only have what two or three active right now. Right now. Talking and to them. and mm -hmm. they would have to just fall under this guideline every three years. They got to make sure that y'all do your site or you got to make sure you do it whatever. You mm -hmm. just put a little check mark on solar farms every three years. And 
I, Same thing that we're doing with heavy industri industrial. Yeah. I mean, you got to do it. It's part of y'all's job. I mean, and in the Hido, it, yeah. it does put the burden on the industry to come to us to renew their permit. Right. As opposed to proposing the other way. Was planning unanimous on not changing? Yes. Okay, how many, how many people is there? So I know subcommittee, there's three people that's out on subcommittee. No one on the subcommittee was interested in making that change. I probably had maybe two that were semi-interested in making this change on the uh, planning board. We have a board of 13. Okay. What was... Uh, how many, excuse me, how many were present for the vote? Uh, you have a board of 13, but... We have uh, a board of 13. I believe we had 11 that night, so we had a pretty good turnout for that one. What's the uh, main concern collectively, uh, consensus-wise, of the 11 that they were opposed? What, what was there? The big concern was that they want to have enough teeth to take care of a problem, and they don't know that just the enforcement section gives them enough teeth to do what they want to make sure we can take care of. Well, Which is kind of the same yeah. thing that they would did when we rewrote the Hido. It was the concern that if something goes wrong, we need the ability to get take care of it as quickly as possible and pull that permit if we have to faster than our enforcement section allows us. From what the industry is saying, this is a poison pill and we won't have any solar farms to inspect. It's not a matter of <laughs> whether or not, you know, how many you're going to have to inspect. It's not going to be any because the they won't be able to get if their you, financing. They won't yeah, be able to come Yeah, if you can't get here. a finance, it's never going to happen. That's right. Yeah. I'll make the motion if it's a... Well, she hasn't answered all my okay. questions yet, Bill. Uh, the... Uh, uh, national concern that there that appears to be cropping up on this issue you know that I cited uh, are Did, we you're even talking looking about environmental at that? concerns more? well everything everything where there could be a concern yes so I know there's some places that don't have decommissioning plans so once these finish off their lifespan of the 25 to 30 years they're just there and local governments don't have any teeth to get that material out of there and it, nobody maintains it. it just sits there and kind of falls apart so we do have that in our ordinance. That's something like way back when all this started, people didn't realize they needed to put that piece in and then it came after the fact and so they lost some ability to do that in the early, early projects. We don't have that problem so we've written that in our ordinance. There are some that are afraid that solar farms create cancer. Uh, I don't think that that's actually been proven for sure that, that there's some fear of that more or less. And just way solar farms go in there's a little land disturbance when it's put in but then the grass grows up underneath the panels so there's very little ground issues or water runoff kind of things any different than the natural land water world anyway and there are some people that seem to think that it would be and we haven't seen that what about the Just disposal here. of panels and batteries and so forth so right now they have a recycling program for those. Um, there's parts of them can be recycled, all of it cannot. So they have a way of disposing of that that is environmental friendly from what I understand. I haven't had to do a whole lot of that, haven't been in a lot of decommissioning areas. Everything's kind of new around here, so it's getting put in more than taken down. Okay, I'm through. If I vote with the planning, I'd be voting against the motion to approve this is that correct i want to make sure no the ordinance as a whole we of course think is something very efficient for the yeah. county and should be done it's just a little tweaking of the language for the renewal just that amending is one line in this thing is basically what we're talking of maybe amending before we vote on the order is that That's right i want to vote with planning on so what well, planning is going to recommend day. approval of the ordinance. If we have to have a small tweak in the renewal, I think we can live with that okay. as opposed well, to losing the whole ordinance. I, I would like to hear Clyde just respond to the mm -hmm. proposed what one sentence right there is really what this boils down to. But, well, you could follow the method that the Department of Transportation uses when you want to renew your license. You don't have to renew it, but when you do. You have to say I've got insurance and my car's been inspected, it's not polluting, it's not unsafe. You may just want to make that re registration renewal rather than expiration. I think that's a good the, idea. The expiration word is what really, like Steve said, a banker's going to see that and say, well, you're only allowed to operate for three years, so now 
what are you going to do if they change? What if you got a new board of commissioners that decide, oh, let's amend this ordinance in three years? You come up for a renewal. <clears throat> Right. Where do you go, yeah. Mr. Banker? It's important That's to right. remember <laughs> that you're talking about two different permits, the operational permit mm -hmm. to build, and then, I mean, the construction permit to build, and the operational permit mm -hmm. needs to be renewed. Just like your license and registration exactly. and your driver's license needs to be renewed. So in order to do that, they go out, they say, okay, mm -hmm. we want to renew it. And we're signing this affidavit that says, everything is done that it's, needs to be done and this isn't carte blanche to say you can run for 50 years and never anybody from the county come and right. interject to what's going on so right. well, this appears to be one and the same though it doesn't differentiate between construction and uh, operations right so the operations permit you get the construction permit and once you've actually built it out then we give that operations permit gives right. them the go gives them a uh, building inspections department will turn their power on so that's kind of the trigger for all of this renewal. Renewal wouldn't start until after you can actually operate. Did you have a state template to work with on the permit or on the uh, solar energy process? Or we did. That's part of where the aviation decommissioning plan. The aviation, and right? Mm -hmm. What do other counties do? Is this uh, what would be more typical of the industry and other counties' practices? Would it be to have the permit expire, or would it be to have uh, an inspection once every three years and then, then renewal renewal a lot of places don't renew if they have an issue they go through their enforcement process this is not really part of those ordinances to do a so this is actually an extra layer yeah. that we've added mm -hmm. so. and of course anybody can do an inspection at any time so that language isn't necessary to add on unless you just want to and that's what our board had wanted to do right Bill, you stick with your motion there too. Well, I'd like to add what Clyde said. At least we, I don't want to make it hard to to stay in business to, to get a loan, to stay in business. So I'd like to add, make a motion that we allow them to uh, get it renewed without, you know, how would you want to say that? I just say, just require that it be renewed every three years. And just strike the end automatically. Just take expiration out. That seems to be their uh, word they don't like. Yeah. Clyde, I have a well, suggestion here um, where he said, shall be subject to a site inspection. So, say, shall be renewed subject to a site and a satisfactory site inspection. Yes. That's a good addition. That work. Yeah. yeah. You just put shall be renewed subject to. Subject to a satisfactory to, site inspection. Yeah. yeah. And that um, would fix that right there. That's my motion to that. Can I amend your, you've got a second on your motion? Not done it. Okay. Can I second that motion subject to a couple of other typos that I'd like to point out to get it fixed? Uh, section five, you've got, if you follow the flow under article four, let's see that was right. Article four. Um, well, um, right under Article four, you've got uh, section. One, two, three, four. Then under section four, you've got subsection one, then some subsections under that, then subsection two, fees. Subsection three, approval of SES permit application. Subsection four is appeal of a denied application. Then you've got item, or what appears to be subsection five, but that looks like that is supposed to be, that's either supposed to be shouldn't be under section <laughs> five it should be section five. section yeah. and then under that you've got subsection a and then you've got a two which <laughs> probably should either be one or a should be one and then two and then three Egg a should be one you see that Clyde? Yeah. yeah a should be one okay
Is that your amendment? That's too? my well, amendment. Well, a uh, friend of mine, does it affect the cows? That's all I want to no. affect the cows. <laughs> <laughs> Not to my knowledge. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it affects farmland preservation. <laughs> you know, well, that's, that was one of the points I was bringing up, but uh, okay. So, is that your amended motion? That's my amended Mr. motion, yes, okay, thank you. So, we've got a motion and a second now. <clears throat> Could I ask another question then? Does the district, the farm district, have rules that kind of help pr preserve away from that, if that's what they want to do? Not yet. <clears throat> All right. Somebody needs to get behind them. I yeah, know you will. It's a subject of discussion. All right. All right, so we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Carter to approve the solar energy system ordinance as amended. Is that correct? Yeah. That's correct. Is there any more discussion? Uh, if not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <clears throat> All right. Thank you. And um, I also want to thank the Planning Board subcommittee and the Planning Board. I know that the subcommittee especially worked really, really hard on this for a long time. And they're just a group of citizen, not just, they are a group of citizen volunteers who um, really, you know, sacrificed their personal time. They could have been doing other stuff. And this stuff is uh, pretty technical and not interesting to many people find it less than interesting so we really appreciate citizens who are willing to give up their time and energy and be engaged in all of that I, I also understand you have a landscaper on there which is great that can add comments to help you kind of understand trees and plant and placement and all that good stuff so. Yeah, I think his uh, expertise, uh, his Bond Willoughby, I'll call his name, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, his expertise was very well received and valuable yep. to that process. And um, who were the other people on that subcommittee? Um, Ashley Harris was on there, and Jean Brooks, he's a vice chair. Great. And then the people who serve on the planning board as well. They, I right, they did a final review approval. They worked really hard on this ordinance um, for a long time. Thank you, Tanya. Mm -hmm. you thank, you. thank you. Thank you. I thought the rest of the ordinance. Yeah, I think it's really very good ordinance. I think we're, we're in good shape. All right. So the next <laughs> item on our agenda is a request to set a public hearing for a proposed mobile home park, but it's a tiny house park. Do you want to tell us this a little is, bit about um, it? Something that this board has never seen since the ordinance was written uh, back in about 15. Things changed over and planning took over what was mobile home parks and uh, camper, uh, campground kind of thing. And it merged into one ordinance and it became ours. So no one has come before any of the boards asking for any kind of modification to the ordinance requirements. So this will be a first. This hearing is a quasi-judicial hearing. Y'all got your information on what those are and everything. So it's a little more teeth to it, a little more processy than a regular public hearing. But this has come before the uh, planning board and you'll see at the end of July is when planning board heard their case and gave a recommendation of approval uh, seems like it's taken a little while to get through but the owners have asked how the meetings laid out that they could be at a night meeting so that's how we kind of had to shuffle a little to get all that in line for them that's how we're ending up to request the public hearing to be at the end of September at September 21st meeting so the request is for September 21st yes ma'am at um, 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. I'll make a motion that we have that. Second. Mr. Boswell has made a motion that we approve a public hearing for that um, proposed mobile home park at September 21st at 7 p.m. And Commissioner Carter has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. And then we have another public hearing for a community development block grant. So what we're asking for is a blanket uh, public hearing. It's two separate dates that you have to have those for community development block grant program. The program actually puts out different types of grants throughout the years. So we want it just for community development block grant. However, if you see in the write up that we are looking at a specific coronavirus uh, grant that they're putting out that we're looking to make application for. 
but we have to meet these two public hearing requirements to get to put the application in. So we're looking for the first public hearing to be September 21st, uh, if the board wishes. I'll make a motion that we do the public hearing September 21st. Second. Second. Bill. Okay, Mr. Boswell has made a motion and Mr. Lashley has seconded it to set a public hearing for that purpose on that date. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. Uh. Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right. Uh, next item on our agenda is uh, the Alamance County Voluntary Agricultural District presentation. We have Brad Moore, who's our Soil and Water Conservation Administrator, and Mr. Frank Bell. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank Good morning. you for this uh, time that you give me to um, speak with you this morning. Uh, one of the handouts, one with the yellow on it, you can just look at it at your leisure. It's basically kind of a one page snapshot of the history of the VAD and the farmland preservation program uh, since the beginning. Uh, as many of you know, that if you travel or lived here very long at all, that North Carolina is a very diverse agriculture state. We produce everything from catfish to Christmas trees. <laughs> um, North Carolina is very important in the food production system, not only here, but in the nation as well. But there is one statistic that I'm not very proud of that we rank very high in. According to the American Farmland Trust, North Carolina ranks number two in the nation for farmland loss between 2001 and 2016. In 2001, the Voluntary Agriculture District was formed out of the concerns and challenges that landowners were facing at that time with new development. Primarily uh, when everybody's backyard in a new subdivision backs up to a cow pasture or farm field, there was some challenges, uh, misconceptions, things of that nature. Basically, the VAD program uh, allows farmers to be highlighted on a map that's located in register of deeds and it informs potential new neighbors that they're moving into an agriculture community. In 2005, <laughs> House Bill 607 established a North Carolina Agriculture Development and Farmland Preservation Trust Fund. This program uh, assists with the purchase of development rights. In 2007, Alamance County submitted their first application <coughs> excuse me, to the program and was awarded our first grant. Uh, with a combination of state and county funds, we were able to permanently preserve 120.16 acres in the lower part of the county. Since that time, Alamance County has received six more grants. Some of our more recent successes that you've heard me talk about is the Lewis and Chandler farms that were closed on earlier this year. We closed on them uh, basically in uh, February and June, and we started on them basically in 2017, September 2017. So you can see the length that these, uh, some of these <coughs> contracts have to get closed. Um, you've heard let me talk about some of these farms before. Lewis is a small dairy farm in the southern part of the county that preserved 92.66 acres. And Chandler is a great small grain farm in the northern part of the county that preserved a little over 75 acres. With a combination of state and county funds, the program has permanently preserved 
580.8 acres. To date, $371,073 of county funds have been used to leverage $1,302,981 in state funds and landowner donations. At this time, we have some comments from Mr. Bell. Thank you, Brad. I can't talk with this thing. It's hard on. to do, isn't it, Frank? I hope. <laughs> Am I in compliance? You're fine. First of all, I've been in this county 60 years as of June the 1st. I call this home. It's a wonderful place to live. It's a wonderful place to educate your kids. And I'm proud to call this home. The first thing that I want to say today is this. Every time I've been before you guys, I beg for money to be put into the budget for farmland preservation. You heard the statistics. We got to do something about those figures. <coughs> if we're going to survive in the county that I love and you love so well, we have got to make, create some means to preserve this land that we can produce food and fiber. The first thing that I want to share with you is give you a, a word of thanks. In 27, uh, in 2010, I had a meeting with the chair of that co of the county commissioners. At, at that time, was Tom Manning and Bill Lashley. We discussed some of the opportunities that we had in this county to promote revenue. You listened, but most importantly, you acted on the recommendations that we had and you brought it back and y'all decided and passed to hire two employees into the tax department, which for years we had not audited present use value. I'm going to give you a brief. We have added since 2010 40, almost $48 million to the tax base in this county because we took action. It's cost a little, but today we have taken out of that program 585 farms that did not comply, which created a revenue to this county of about a million eight hundred thousand dollars. That's reoccurring income every year. Thank you for listening. After reviewing these figures and being involved in this operation for the last eleven years. I've come to some awakening realizations. We cannot, on the m money that we're being given and the budget constraints each year, and y'all know better than I know, everybody wants money. They want more money than they had last year. <laughs> so we have we cannot afford to continue to it just alone have the support of the county in, ta in, uh, in budgetary money and the 
matching of the state if we're going to farm land preservation if we're going to preserve the farms in this county. As you all know, this pandemic has caused a lot of things. It's caused us to look at a lot of reruns <laughs> and it's given us an opportunity to use our minds. I think you all know I don't have to push this point that my love is for rural people. That is the salt of the earth. Those are the people that put the food on our tables. I got to thinking about this. In 2001, I believe it was, that we formed this VAD program. I was happened to be on that committee for six years, the original. This year before last, Brad came to me and wanted to know if I would consider serving again. <laughs> and I don't have the word no in my vocabulary. I'm going to try to do what I can to help my fellow man. So I went home, I started thinking, how can we put together a volunteer program that will help our young farmers and ranchers? And I've come up with a brainstorm and I want y'all to listen to today and give us your opinion and your endorsement. I shared this with Mr. Hey Good. He thought it had merit. We took it from there to the VAD board and introduced it to them, and they thought it had merit. We in turn, in turn formed a committee to continue to talk about it, and I introduced it to that committee. That committee con uh, consisted of Mr. Haygood, Clyde Albright, Amy Gailey, Miss Kaylin Kingsbury, and y'all know who her, we got into a relationship with them in 2015, the conservatory, Brian Moore, and myself. We sat here and discussed it, and I want to, I want to share with you the thought that we had. First of all, there is a need in the community, in the county, among older people who are landowners that don't have any way to disperse their assets. They don't know how to get rid of their farm. They don't have any relatives. So we agreed that we need to, as a county, come up with a simple way for them to contribute to this farmland preservation. If an older couple wants to give, donate the farm, Buster Sykes is an example. Y'all know familiar with all of that. If they want to donate it to the county, then we want to learn how to agree to take care of that. If they want to will it to the county, we'll accept it. We'll even carry it through probate. And there's two sides of that. We can help a young farmer by doing this if we want to give him half of the revenue that we received and he financed the other half, then that gives him inroads to be able to afford it. That's one phase. Here's the other phase. Let's say that we inherit a hundred acre farm. If we inherit the hundred acre farm, we've got to opportunity to accept it 
into the county, it becomes a county property. We can lease it, and this is a very viable option. There are young couples out there that think they want to farm, but they have never been exposed. We as a county could lease that land to them for an interim period of time so that they could test some water, so to speak. At the end of that time, they have the option to buy that property or forget about it, drop it, drop a lease. We can do it over and over and over again. The other thing, we need to make it simple enough for people. Tim has got a lot. He decided he's a farmer, but he's inherited a lot down yonder on ABC Street. And he is a friend of agriculture, and he wants to donate that lot to the county. So what we do, we advertise it and we sell it. And it goes in the farmland preservation funds to pay for rights down the road. You see, these possibilities exist. There's a lot of expertise right here in this room today. We got the know-how, we got the expertise, and we've got the clout to get to the people that can help us accomplish what we want to accomplish. We've got to have the will. Those people out there struggling, trying to find out what am I going to do with my property and who do I want to leave it to? And there's people out there just begging for the opportunity to have the opportunity to grasp grasp it and do something with it. But they don't know how the help. We need to put the expertise and the know-how behind it to put a program in place that's affordable. The other thing, this is not set in stone. This is, we're in a committee talking about it. <coughs> How many of you know anything about a QCD? Quick claim deed? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Y'all ain't old enough yet to remember that. <laughs> the law is that when you become 70 years old, if you're in an investment program, you've got to take some of that investment out, a percentage of it yearly. RMD. Huh? RMD, required right. minimum distribution. Right. Now, a qualified credit distribution, that's what it amounts to. There are people out there that don't have any farming ability and don't care, but they love the rural area. They love the green space. We've already took that analysis. We know where we stand in this county as it relates to the popularity among green space. There are people, I'm one of them, that would be willing, and that's on a yearly basis at the end of December every year, you've got to make a determination mm -hmm. of how much and where you're going to put it. You can roll it over, but you're going to pay tax on it. Some of these people would determine that I want to give $10,000 to farmland preservation or I want to give 15 or whatever the amount is. So they got to, they can then designate that. Now, what we need to do and what we will do as a committee is that we need to let them know, and I'm getting to that, what the tax benefit for them doing that would be to their bottom line. Right. It's can make a big difference. Mm -hmm. That's another part of the program. I believe that this 
if we put together, it's not in, it's it's not in stone. It's a work in progress at this point. This committee, and I think all of you know that we've got the ability. These committee, Clyde's a lawyer. Kaylee is a, a legal counsel as well. She's working with us already. We've got the ability to search this thing out and research it and make it work. But we've got to keep it simple. And we've got to set it. We've got to set it. Well, I'm going to tell you straight up, I'm not a fan of our promoting things in the county, what we've done to promote what we want to accomplish. I want, and I'm on, we ain't even talked about this as a committee, but it's in my <laughs> mind. I want us, and I'll pay for it, to get a professional people that put together a brochure that depicts exactly what the program entails, how it will benefit those people who are donors, and that's what we put together and we sell it to the general public. I feel like this can be a solution for the state of North Carolina and every 100 counties it is to adopt some program of this nature. But we can be the pilot shield. I like this, this is the reason I like this county because we listen and we act. And usually the results is positive. What I want from you people this morning, and Brad won't from the volunteer act, I'll answer any questions you got, and if I can, I want an endorsement from you people. See, if we, you either like the program and give us the authority to go ahead and proceed with a, a final draft of what we propose to do, and then when we get the final draft done, we'll come back to you for any suggestions you've got or any changes you want made, and we'll adopt it, and we'll go, go full bore. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I do too. I think it's a great idea. It'll help the county and it'll help the individuals that want to live in that green space. Frank, one thing you just said then reminds me back years ago when the voluntary ag started putting these programs together. The state started looking here to figure out how to do things. And I think what you've come up with here is an excellent idea. Yeah, people who's got money were willing to give that money away and hopefully they, they'll stop giving to these liberal colleges. <laughs> Or you can say, Amen. are there any would be a tax benefit. Yeah, be a tax benefit. That's yeah. right. Get an RMD out of a, out of a <laughs> well, retirement that's, fund. That's, that's what's been on my mind. And uh, everybody's listened to it, thought it was a, a, an idea that we could make work. So, so Frank, would this committee be kind of coordinated with Brad and the yeah. voluntary ag kind of leader on the yes. point of it to yes. put it together? Would yeah. it have to be a 501c3? Is that what we're looking at? I think that that would be a detail to be worked out. Um, what kind We've of got structure? some homework to do, mm -hmm. but it ain't nothing we can't get accomplished. Right. That's right. That's right. Well, I think our staff is nodding their head like this pretty. Yeah, I appreciate him <laughs> listening, listening to an old plow boy. <laughs> 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 well, um, motion on that? I don't think we need a motion. I think consensus. we have a consensus that the general idea has the blessing of the board. I did have a couple of remarks that I wanted to make. You know, we've been in the process of updating our land development plan, and there's been a lot of public input received as part of that process, and it has been overwhelming and consistent in support of farmland preservation. That has been a goal that has been voiced by the people who've, um, the residents who have looked at the draft land development plan or as it's come forward people have consistently emphasized that farmland preservation is a big general goal of 
the community. Also, it's one of our uh, smart pillars, growth is yeah. one of our pillars yep. for Back our culture. vision, yeah. our uh, strategic plan. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, and then I was recalling that in fiscal year 19, 2019, 2020, we added position to the planning department. And the reason we added that position, and there was a, I'm sure Mr. Bell remembers very well that there, the farmland preservation folks wanted an increase in the amount of money that was going to farmland preservation. 250. But then we discussed it and decided to take some of that money and allocate it toward that position instead so that um, so we could deal with some of our land use challenges and uh, coordinate with the land development plan and other things. And so I would suggest, one of the things that I've noticed working in local government is that things get done and proceed much more smoothly when you have a staff person who is dedicated to be the meeting scheduler, the minute taker, the person who has responsibility for the follow through with different things. And so, um, you know, with uh, due respect to the county manager and to the planning director, I would suggest, humbly suggest, that, that person whose position was added to the planning department that um, that person Experience. be considered as uh, a staff person who's working with uh, Mr. Bell and Brad Moore and other people um, to facilitate that and okay. to make it better. And if it turns More out, in looking at the work plan and what that person is already doing, if shifting things around makes more sense, then um, that's, good that's just that's a mm -hmm. suggestion. Sort of. Sort of. Are we looking at a at a <clears throat> recommendation to bring back to the commission then that we would then vote on because we're not talking about a vote today I think so yes that's correct I think today we wanted to hear if you if the board was supportive of what we've been talking about with mr. Bell and it obviously is then uh, we'll work to put together Clyde's help Tanya Brad mr. Bell uh, something to bring back to you at a subsequent meeting we'll try to do this soon because we know those opportunities are out there uh, but bring something back for you to approve that has some infrastructure that Clyde can help us put together that allows some of these things Mr. Bell's talking about to actually start happening quickly. If you get it before the end of the year, people are making right. these contributions and taking care of that. that. We so. wanted this done as quick as possible. Right. Some of you guys ain't going to be here after November or to January. You're going to miss us, aren't you, Frank? <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank you for having the ear for agriculture. All of you have been very supportive. We don't know that's going to happen after November. So thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Yep. Thank I want you. to reflect on a comment that Brad made, uh, catfish to Christmas trees. <laughs> you know that it's actually recycled because our wildlife club, Alamance Wildlife Club, collects Christmas trees off the side of the road and puts them in our ponds to create habitats for, for, fish. for young fish as they're <laughs> hatching to grow in the pond. So. Uh, it's a it's a circle yeah hmm. all right oh, before let me before you sit down can you go back several slides uh, some people were holding up signs yeah right there uh the one on the well those two on the right with the streaks is that what does that say i can't read that that's a voluntary act district oh, okay yes sir so that's, that's one of the larger signs. So when people uh, get in the Voluntary Ag District, we give them a, right. a free sign. It's about the size of a license plate. And it, it looks like that. A lot of people display them like on their mailbox, things of that nature. Yeah. Some people choose to um, uh, purchase a larger sign. And uh, some people, people put it at the driveways or interest to the farms. And uh, I think one of the goals this year for the Soil and Water Office is to uh, come up with possibly a video or a brochure that explains to the general public what this sign is when people drive around the county they see what it is just to help uh, get some better understanding but this lets them know that they're in an agriculture district and they may have sounds and smells associated with farms. <laughs> yeah, they're all over the they're all over the Guilford County everywhere I go in Guilford yeah, County I'll it. see a sign yeah. similar to that. In Guilford County I believe they they give out the large signs for free yeah and we looked at some different grants and so forth but, uh, but that's what that is. Those are the closing uh, there, there on the right is uh, Randy Lewis uh, the closing in uh, February and the one on the left is uh, Mr. Henry Chandler 
uh, closing we did, I believe, in uh, in June. And they're in the permanent. This permanent, yeah. it'll be yes. it'll be preserved forever. Yep. Well, I got to tell you this, and I'm going to tell you right now, I need to probably grace your farm before I leave this state, but because uh, I know I haven't been out there, and I do want to say though, I admire the heck out of you. And over in Guilford County. Steve's Troxter, you know where Steve's Troxter's farm is up there? Yeah. He's got that tobacco. I went out there. Well, I go out there every year and stand at the end. Of, I did it this year. Stand, stood at the end of his rows, go back to his house <laughs> when he first planted, when he put out. And then I went back for two and a half months and watched that tobacco grow. And it's, it's I love spring when they start <laughs> planting all this stuff. Went over to Kernersville, over by Glen High School, where they have this huge Shields farm that grows triple sweet corn, and and watched that grow and, and sold at the farmers market, and uh, and then there's a dairy over the, off of uh, in Guilford County. Sop huh? Sopwell Farm. I believe that's right. right that is the name of it. Yeah. And uh, went up to the fence and took pictures of cows. <laughs> well, what gets me is I'll have a student in my car and I'll point to a big tobacco crop and I'll say, Do you know what that is? And this girl driving one day, she said, Lettuce? And <laughs> she knew it was tobacco when she got out of that car. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Sure. Thank uh, you, Frank. We've been going an hour and a half, so let's have a recess. Oh, thank you very much for that. <laughs> Reconvene um, after the recess. The next item on the agenda is the presentation about the monument on Court Square from the county attorney. Good morning. Mr. Albright, if you wouldn't mind coming up over here to do your presentation, well, I think right. we would appreciate it. I'm not sure the camera can get you over there very well. Okay. He's got a face for radio, though. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have you do that. Thank you. At least you got some. Yeah, well. <laughs> Howard Coble used to tell me I'd never trust anybody with all your hair, Clyde. He's <laughs> <tell me that. laughs> <clears throat> but anyway, uh, I've been asked to give you a, a summary of the laws regarding the monument. Um, we've done a study on the ownership of the monument and determined that it, May 16, 1914, it was presented to the county and was accepted by the county. And it sits on county property. Um, in North Carolina, too close to it. North, Car North Carolina has a, uh, we're not a home rule state and, and county government is is obliged to follow state law. <coughs> we don't have any law other than that that we get from the state. And in 2015, <clears throat> the state of North Carolina uh, passed General Statute 100-2.1, Protection of Monuments, Memorials, and Works of Art. Section B of that statute is entitled limitations on removal and an object of remembrance located on public property may not be permanently removed and may only be relocated whether temporarily or permanently under the circumstances set forth in the law and those circumstances are if you temporarily remove it to preserve it or if you're going to build a new courthouse and you want to remove it, you have to put it back within 90 days of the completion of the project. Um, if you want to move it to a, a location other than where it sits, it must be permanently relocated to a site of similar prominence, honor, visibility, availability, and access that are within the boundaries of the county. So, uh, specifically it says you can't relocate it to a museum, a cemetery, or a mausoleum, unless it was originally placed there. And that, that is the sum, summary of the law as it applies to the monument. Bob, answer any questions if you have any. Did, they, did, the, did that law state 
limitations to the county or I was when I was reading over the law I thought it might include the fact that it's in Graham City would it not have to remain in the city well it just says the jurisdiction of where it uh, is located so that would be Alamance County um, you have to be a, a place of prominence and I think that right. would require it to remain somewhere close to where it is now in front of a courthouse now section a of this law applies to the state of north carolina and it says uh, if it's owned by the state then before you move it you have to get the authority and approval of the north carolina historical right. commission but they make a distinction between state-owned uh, memorials and county -owned memorials <coughs> So really, uh, that, that puts the limits on you as to what you can do under the existing law. So, the only way we can move it is the General Assembly said you can move it. If, if the General Assembly sh should change the law, then the county could do, if it allows you to, uh, th then you would, have, you would be bound by that state law. So we have to have their stamp of approval to ever, as a board, remove it, right? Yes. We're not a home rule state. It's Dillon Law, isn't it? Well, I remember yes. that something from Home Builders when you're, we sued you're the correct. state because a lot of local jurisdictions were doing uh, impact fees. Charlotte tried to do that with the bathroom bill. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't have any jurisdiction. And, of course, the cities, the same thing. They've got right. no authority other than what the state licenses them to have. We're a political subdivision of the state, subject to the authority of the General Assembly. So even if we passed it or got a bill passed to allow for a vote, vote could not be taken until 2022. And even if there was a vote to relocate it, it would have to be under the restrictions of that code. Unless unless they amend this law right. in addition to passing that other law. And legislation. Right. And that would be for the General Assembly to consider and the governor to sign. It's kind of clear cut, isn't it? It's really limited as to what you can do. I think the goal is protect. The, the title says protection of monuments, memorials, and works of art. So, so um, <clears throat> I understand that uh, Chatham County moved theirs. Uh, there was a monument in Winston Salem that got moved. But can you so can you distinguish between those situations and Alamance County situation? I don't know who owned the monument in Chatham or in Winston Salem. That seems to be a key. Um, the statute talks about the uh, property being on public property, and I think that is the distinction there, because in, I believe in Winston Salem it was continually owned by the daughters. Of exactly. The right? They didn't switch ownership and get it, did it to not. the city or the county. And I believe Chatham County may have a license agreement or some type of written agreement. We, we could not find that in our records. And we went all the way back to 1849 when this county was formed and looked at everything we had access to, uh, including the articles from the, the Gleaner, mm -hmm. uh, which is online. Uh, you, can read, you can read about the dedication and, uh, and the county commissioner, the chairman of the county commissioner, uh, at the time, I've got his name here, the language used was, um, let me see, got a hold? Uh, presentation of the monument by the president of the daughters and then uh, acceptance of the monument by George T. Williamson, chairman of the board of the county commission. So when you um, look back through the minutes, was there <coughs> of the Board of County Commissioners from that time period, were there any um, entries regarding payment for the monument? There was a state law authorizing the payment of, um, I think, $1,000 from the county and $1,000 from the city of Graham, authorized up to that amount to pay for the base. A state law? Yes, state law. State law. State law. Oh. So that they authorized that to yes. actually build the 
space in to set the monument on. In 1913. Um, that courthouse that's standing there now was put up in 22. The old courthouse was smaller and uh, it had a set of scales mm -hmm. because this was a marketplace. This is where people came to sell their vegetables and, and food and trade. And they had a set of scales right there where the uh, monument stands now. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in, in 1914, when they dedicated and placed the monument, they moved the scales and set the monument there. And then um, it was determined the courthouse was too small. And so in 1921, the General Assembly authorized the county to build the new courthouse and to raise taxes to pay for it. And at that time, the monument was moved because and it's kind of funny, the documents I read, the Johnson brothers tore the whole courthouse down. And um, <laughs> Mr. Nix offered his store as a temporary courthouse while the new one was being built. <clears throat> and then after the new one was built, they put the monument back. But that's, that's a, a hard read if you go through the minute book because it's all in cursive. Oh gosh! Very. And they didn't have Tory back then to get it good. <laughs> well, they, they didn't have typewriters, and uh, the handwriting's beautiful, but you just have to mm -hmm. uh, get used to reading it. This is probably look like F's. <laughs> so, um, the uh, question has been raised to me whether. Statute 100-2.1, the Protection of Monuments Law, it says that it applies to, to things owned by the state. Can you uh, talk about that a little bit more? Well, it's in Section A, and it's done by exception. Um, it refers to except as otherwise provided in subsection B, a monument, memorial, or work of art owned by the state may not be removed, relocated, or altered in any way without the approval of the North Carolina Historical Commission because it's state-owned. But that's specifically state-owned. Yeah, that, that state that's our exclusion. That's the it. County, right? And then it refers you to Section B, which <coughs> talks about any remembrance located on public property may not be permanently removed, right. relocated, uh, except under the circumstances that I just read to you. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. So it seems like part of the, I mean, the crux of the issue is <clears throat> people will say that, uh, well, there's a pretty vocal group that says that it represents something that is offensive, especially to people of color, and it's in a location that people of color have to um, experience it or view it on their way to the courthouse. And so it should be moved. So part of the problem with it is its prominence. And the law requires us to move it to some place of equal prominence. So that problem is inextractable, really. Because any place we would move it to that would be of equal prominence would also be offensive to people of color and right. and others. Well, there are there are people in our country that burn our flag, so the American flag may cause uh, adverse reactions emotionally by some. Um, but it's our flag, and it's in a place of prominence in front of the courthouse, in and front of all of our them. courthouses. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that argument. And, and I understand what they're saying. Their statement change. Um, but there are there are different views on that. This is this law, and this law was written to protect our history and our memorials. So there's there's more to it. There's more to it than the people that want it torn down would have you believe. <clears throat> well, that's how we learn is our history. If we forget history, we will not know where we came from and not know where we're going. Well, the movement afoot today is, ter is to tear down history, it seems like, because, I mean, even a monument to Ulysses S. Grant was torn down, which made no sense at all to me. I mean, 
I may be missing something there, but Christopher Columbus. Um, well, Frederick they tried Douglass. to get to Abraham Lincoln. I mean, the guy that emancipated, you know. The mayor of Washington, D.C. is proposed tearing down the Washington Monument yes. and bulldozing the Jefferson Memorial. Posted that on a page and then took it down within a day or two and replaced the link with something else. But if you tear down history, if you're, you're destined to repeat your history if you keep tearing if you don't tear it down and learn from it. I don't think anybody in here wants to repeat where we were in the 17 and 1800s where we're a different culture now than we were then. And if we're a different culture now than we were then, we all need to come forward. Does anybody have any other questions or comments? <laughs> Thank you, Clyde. All right. Thank you, Clyde. Move Thank forward. Uh, we have a historic courthouse facility use policy. May I reach for my other? Of course. Pile of paper here. <laughs> You may recall we were sued by the NAACP, uh, I think it was in May, uh, over the access to the courthouse and, and the protest to conduct the protest. They also sued the city of Graham. <clears throat> so we have been jointly working with uh, the lawyers for the uh, NAACP. <clears throat> and attempting to come up with a policy that will protect protesters and property and our deputies who, who face the fire every day uh, and also allow people to express uh, their First Amendment rights. And I reviewed with you a copy of that policy. I think I sent it to you last week. I, wanna, I want to emphasize that we are still working on specific <coughs> terms in that policy with the attorneys for the uh, NAACP. But uh, the concerns that, that we have as a, as a board, um, I'm sorry, as a sheriff and as a county is uh, when, when you issue a permit, you gotta be mindful of the danger to health and safety that may be out there. And you have to have an appropriate site <coughs> suggestion. If we have a thousand people coming to protest, <clears throat> uh, it may not be a good place to be in, right in front of the sheriff's office or right in front of this building. Uh, if they want to protest in the traffic circle and block the street off, and we account for public safety and we account for security, then that, those are the type of things that our uh, facility use policy covers. We've also um, added a provision in there for the person that applies for the permit we look at their past conduct whether it was good or bad and uh, those things are considered when issuing a permit we like we also would like to know who that person is um, and that they are indeed serious about complying with the permit requirements and so there's a small fee to process the permit uh, there is also a small group exception uh, to the permit. If you're going to have four or five people, you really don't need uh, that much security or much area to do this. Uh, if it's during the work week and we've got trials going on in our working courthouse, we need to be mindful of that. That's also in the permit under government activity. And uh, <clears throat> there's also a provision for permit approval timelines. Um, one issue that, that they have brought up is the crosswalk. And uh, <clears throat> we've asked them to stay out of the crosswalk because that is a crosswalk. That's not the street. Uh, and people go into the courthouse and use that crosswalk to get to their car or other buildings. Um, and we've got some temporary asset at access restrictions on there too that will protect uh, our citizens. And uh, I think it's good policy. We've worked on it for weeks uh, for these folks since our uh, hearing of July 30th and I think we've come up with a very good policy and a very good permitting process. The uh, Sheriff's Department, uh, <clears throat> Captain Sykes and uh, the Chief uh, Parker have been working with us on this and I think we've got something that's a very good policy but I want to emphasize that 
on the policy, we have an effective date and we have a last revision date, and that and that's put in there to emphasize that we this subject to being revised. And I guess circumstance will determine if it needs to be revised. Yes, is that correct? Question. Yes, sir. Um, is there a requirement for personal or organizational liability for any damages that might occur? <clears throat> well, that's part of our permitting process, knowing who's who. And uh, if there's past misconduct from a group that wants to uh, permit a certain area, if there's been property damage, if there's been a lot of arrests or assault, battery, and that type of thing, those things will be taken into consideration before you issue a permit for a, a group that has a history of and, and that, that's one of the things I insist that we put in there. Our goal is to protect our citizens, the property of our friends here in Graham. That's their goal, too. Um, we want people to be able to express themselves in a peaceful way, but we don't want it to get out of control. And uh, <clears throat> as we've seen throughout our country in the last six to seven months, it has gotten out of control. And this is the type of thing that's a balancing act between the constitutional right to free speech and our desires to protect people and property. Has this been through the court to We we have review? a case we have an ongoing case. Okay. <clears throat> judge Eagles uh, is the a judge assigned to it. And uh, this temporary restraining order doesn't end the lawsuit. The lawsuit is still ongoing. Uh, <clears throat> we're hoping to uh, to reach a settlement, and that's what we're working towards with this. And we think this may be a good a good settlement, a good basis for discussing so. Well, the, the only problem I see in what you said about looking at history on an individual applying for a permit is it's always a first time. At some point, there has to be that first time. Right. And if you don't require personal and organizational liability. In your permit, when they sign it, mm -hmm. recognizing who they represent and in, uh, themselves as an individual, then at least it puts them on notice that if there's damage to be done to our community or communities, that uh, they can be held liable personally and financially for the cost. Well, we're we're in, in enforcing this. We're relying on our uh, law enforcement officers. And the, and the criminal justice system with our DA. Uh, if someone destroys property, and all of these things are filmed, everybody's got their cell phone out. And, and the property owner can determine who destroyed it. They can certainly go after them for that destruction. Um, I don't know of a way we could, to put a limit like that on, on their speech would be difficult, I think. But if we do know that it is a recognized, organ organized event that does this type of thing, <clears throat> sure, we could, we, could, we could deny a permit in those situations. So you're really looking back to find personal liability. If, say, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the guys and I decide I'm gonna go over here and tear something up, you're gonna come after me, not the group, but the person that does that, the damage. And that is, in, that is, uh, but the general statutes that we cite are all under Chapter 14. Um, disorderly conduct and injuries to public buildings and facilities, disorderly conduct, public disturbance, um, standing, sitting, or lying on the highway, uh, second degree trespass, willful and wanton injury to property, all these things are covered in the appendix to the ordinance. All of those are criminal statutes. But if we, if we make it a requirement that they post a bond or something like that, that's too much of a restraint on their free speech. I think the court would probably shoot that down. Just the liability perspective, though, from a civil perspective, is simpler to prosecute than it is from a criminal perspective, right? Well, from, from what I have read and seen, uh, our attorney general uh, is focusing on the prosecution side now, and uh, I believe he's got several hundred uh, defendants he's going to be inviting the court. I think a lot of them are in custody. And uh, once that wave starts, I think you'll see a reduction in this type of activity. When someone knows they're going to be prosecuted, uh, they just think, think twice. Well, you know, a lot of times 
causing problems can not really damage property, but to go out and just block roads. You see this in a lot of the cities. They're just blocking a interstate. Mm -hmm. They can't and do that. that. That's what we have in our policy. They can't block the crosswalk. They have to move on. And uh, we've had pretty good success with it um, thus far, I think. Uh, not I mean, they need to realize that. We, they can't go down here and block that circle up, no matter what they're doing. Well, there's a state law that prohibits it, too. Mm -hmm. Standing, sitting, or lying in the highways is prohibited. You can't I think we need to be as clear as we can possibly be with everybody. I don't care what your opinion or whatever. We as a county need to be clear. This is what we expect in our jurisdiction. Well, I think we're coming close with this policy. And I'd, I'd ask for you to uh, uh, adopt the resolution approving it with the understanding that it is subject to being amended. I'll make that motion. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Sutton to adopt the resolution for the, or the, to approve the resolution adopting the Alamance County Historic Courthouse Facility Use Policy. Would it be appropriate discussion? to have Clyde read what we're exactly approving right here? How about I read it? Are you read? I got it How right about here. you read? <laughs> I have it right here. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, this is the resolution. It's yeah. not the whole policy. I, I know, but it's the resolution. It, it's All right. It summarizes. Do you have copies policy? Not with me. I'll be happy to email it to you. I have your email, you know. There's a link to it in the agenda, I believe, right? If it's in the agenda packet, it should be. Solved. Yeah. It is, I believe. Okay. Is that not what you're reading, Amy? No, I'm reading the resolution. The resolution okay. itself. It's just not the policy. highlights the points that client just went over. That's right. what I've got right here, yeah. Whereas the public areas of the historic courthouse are presumed to be open to the public for lawful purposes, including the free expression of ideas, and whereas law enforcement officers have a duty to safeguard the lawful and open use of the historic courthouse, and protect the free expression of beliefs by imposing reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions for the use of courthouse spaces. And whereas in order to achieve these goals of safeguarding free speech, protecting property, and providing for the safety of individuals, law enforcement officers may temporarily restrict access to certain outdoor historic courthouse spaces during short-term emergency situations. And whereas achieving these goals requires a policy that provides guiding principles and flexibility to respond to specific articulable threats, and whereas the Sheriff's Department has developed a permitting policy and process that addresses location concerns, distinguishes between large and small gatherings, both spontaneous and organized, and sets forth enforcement procedures that preserve the ability of individuals to exercise free speech, maintain the peace, protect public property and prevent injury to the public. Be it therefore resolved that the Alamance County Board of County Commissioners hereby approves and adopts the historic courthouse facility use policy and permitting process. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second to approve that resolution. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right, thank you. Next on our agenda are the budget amendments. Uh, we have something from uh, Parks and Rec. We have Brian Baker, our uh, Parks and Rec director here. Approval to apply, apply for recreational trails program funding. Good morning, Commissioners. Welcome. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. Um, just here to seek approval on behalf of the Recreation and Parks Department to apply for funding uh, for what is phase two of the Cane Creek Mountains natural area we've opened phase one completely now without reservation to the public uh, as of a couple weeks ago uh, it's going well it's very popular um, but we're already starting work on phase two this grant would help us with the construction of trails up to eight miles of trails in this in this phase uh, so this grant is from the recreation trails program it's a state program uh, that provides funds for these and we'll be asking for two hundred and fifty thousand dollars It does require a 25% match However, we've been able to meet that requirement with uh, some of the previous land acquisition and private donations and grants We've already received so I'm not seeking any additional county funding today 
just permission to apply for this grant and if it's awarded to amend the budget um, as required. Make a motion to approve. Sir. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Lashley to approve that application. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the health department has a request for approval to apply for a grant, and we have interim health director Alex Rimmer here. Welcome. How are you doing? Good, Good morning. morning. How are y'all? So um, we're requesting approval for a maternal health grant that focuses on um, access to telecare. And so um, we typically, right now we have as our standard of care, um, a centering pregnancy program. And what that does is it allows cohorts of women that are pregnant to have their care together. Um, it allows for um, decrease in preterm and low birth rates, increase in breastfeeding. And so this increases birth outcomes. And so Alamance County actually has a higher rate of preterm births than the state. So we're at 11.2, um, whereas the state is at 10.4. And um, this is an evidence-based program. And so since COVID, this program was put on hold. And um, we're actually one of the pilot counties. Our staff at the health department created a virtual program. Um, to use Zoom to be able to do this with breakout rooms. And so one of the biggest barriers that we found is that most of our clients don't have access to using data on their phones and things like that. And so um, in the last community health assessment, access to care was identified as one of our main things throughout the community that we needed. And so this grant would allow us to um, be able to give our patients Wi-Fi hotspots and data plans. Um, we'd be able to send home equipment to do blood pressure checks, scales, checking blood sugar for those that it's necessary for, and it would reduce exposure um, so they wouldn't be coming into the clinic quite as often. Um, and, you know, as our maternity patients, they are a highly susceptible population, and so just having it where they're able to get proper care at home would be really important. Um, right now, we've been doing a lot of over the phone, um, and so we can't see the patient, and so that level of care is not able to be met like we would like. Uh, so this runs from October 1st until April 31st of 2021. Um, there's no county match that needs to be met. It's, um, it's we are asking for $60,000 with the grant, and so we just wanted to um, seek approval for that. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Carter and a second by Commissioner Lashley to approve that application. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Now, don't go. Uh, tell me what I need to do here. I asked her uh, out of session. <laughs> Could I ask some questions about the COVID scenario? Um, How would you prefer to handle that? We've got uh, commissioner comments coming up. You could wait until then, but if you want to just go ahead. And well, I'll leave that up to her. If she wants to wait to then, I'll be glad to. Depends on what the questions are. All right. Now, <laughs> now what I want to ask uh, is the uh we were showing <clears throat> uh seventy one thousand six ninety two is that correct negative tests is that does that sound right so i haven't actually seen that figure um uh -huh. so what i look at is the the number of tests weekly versus the percent positivity of right. the amount of tests that are done so i don't want to speak to that but i can look i guess see. this is us i mean it's showing uh positive total positive forty three hundred thirty four so, uh, I mean, it looks like Alamance County. I mean, it's, it's on this last report that Michelle Gate put out, I guess. But my question is really positive, I believe it or not. Uh, <laughs> you got total case uh, tests, 76,374, and you got uh, 71,692 negative. Total population of Alamance County is what? One, what? 66. Brian? Yes, between 160 170,000. All right, so well, that's a big gap there. But uh, if you've got 71,000 or 76,374 that's been tested now, that's you would imagine that the majority of those are adults, I would assume. Would you assume that? So I don't know where that number is coming from, so I don't really want to speak to it. Um, just because on average we've had about 3,000 tests per week, and I have to go back and do the math. 
to really okay. know. Um, and looking at ages, so when we look at ages, we don't, in the beginning, they weren't reporting negative tests back to us. And so it's really hard to pull that data. So we have the data for the positive cases, um, like we show in our weekly demographic, where you'll see kind of the age range and different things. And, and I believe 24 to four, the, the 20s to 40s is the highest caseload. Um, I know we talked a little bit about that before. Um, but as far as who's getting the test, I really don't, I don't have those numbers. Yeah. Well, not so many people in the county, but, uh, <laughs> and, I, and I, mean that, I don't mean that sarcastically either. I mean, it just looks like we're testing a lot of our people, and that's great. That's great. I, and I want to ask you, again, there just seems to be a tremendous, a quick in and out process. You know, I've, I've brought this up 15 times, I think, between you and Stacy. But, <clears throat> you know, You've got 5,000 and some, I think, that we tested, uh, 4,300, oh, excuse me, 4,334 cases positive, but we've only got 200 that we're actively looking at right now. And so right, so right now we're actually at 3,432 cumulative cases, so that's over right. the whole time. Um, and that's as of yesterday. I haven't, I don't pull the numbers until around 12 o'clock. So, mm -hmm. um, and we have 319 active cases. Right. That's right what now. I'm trying to refer to. That and figure here there. we got this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So again, I still say it's quick in and out. And I'm not blaming anybody. I mean, it's uh, you know they get cured off quick, don't they? Uh, <laughs> and they're not getting any medical treatment. And uh, that I can that, that we're speaking. I'm not being critical. I'm just saying that you know I'm putting my what I think. I'm putting my perspective on it. Uh, is the rest of the counties do they have so as much of a quick in and out as we do uh, to where you know they've tested thousands but they've only got 300 or 200 or so that are active do you know a trend there i guess it would be about the same wouldn't it so in relation to the counties surrounding us right this second we have a little bit higher percent positivity i don't know if you've seen if you'll go down one more so we were around seven percent um for three weeks, it had right. come drastically down. It's gone up just a little bit. Um, I apologize, I can't read that number from here. 9.1. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and so what that's showing is we have a little bit higher rate and it's hard to really compare because if we start looking at somewhere like Guilford, you have to take the number and look at population right. versus their cumulative cases and active. Um, same if you're looking at Orange um, or Chatham or any of those. So um, we are pretty comparable to the state this, the state percent positivity had been 7% for quite a while. Um, so we are pretty comparable to North yeah. Carolina. So as far as the guidelines on how quickly you would get better, we all follow the CDC guidelines. And so that's going to be the 10 days. Um, if you meet the 10 day requirement with 24 hours fever free, um, your symptoms have decreased. So the cough's not as bad, that kind of thing. Um, then you would be able to come out of isolation at that point at day 10. Um, but as far that's that's the course that everywhere is taking. So all the all the counties in the state. When we look at Friday's report, I thought this was interesting. Randolph County, and I'm not sure exactly how they stack with us on population, but, but we had 3,259 cases at that point and 46 deaths. Randolph County had 2,438 cases and 44 deaths. Um, from a survivability perspective, it sounds like we're doing better than they are. I don't know how I don't know what the, how that relates, but. Uh, um. So I will say our case investigators um, work very hard to stay in contact with the active cases um, and make sure if there is a decrease, um, like let's say that their symptoms are getting. Um, stronger and they need hospital care or they need medical attention they work really hard to make sure that happens and I think that attributes to our lower death rate just because we're making sure that communication is there and so if there's a decline we can make sure they get medical help how is the trace investigation stuff working? I know we were pushing that really hard yeah a month or so ago yeah so we're, we're continuing to do that um, and so the CDC guidelines have changed just a little bit as far as who has to be contacted daily. Um, and so highly susceptible populations, those would be someone we contact daily um, if there's a concern we're worried about. Um, so we are still doing the same case investigation and then contact tracing to make sure that those need, that need to be in quarantine are still being quarantined. Very good. 
do we have any numbers from the outbreak over in the jail? I know we had about 92, I think it was the first report. I think it had gone up a little bit, but recovery wise and uh, yeah. any of those having to be hospitalized. I don't see any increase in the hospitalization numbers. No, so but none have had to be hospitalized um, over the course since the start of the outbreak on the 24th. Um, there's been 113 total inmates. Um, seven have been transferred to other facilities and two have been released. And so that first wave when you're talking about, I think it was 91 or 93, I don't have it in front of me, but um, those people have done their isolation and so they're out. So there's only 14 currently in isolation in the jail okay. right this second. <coughs> that sounds good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda are public speakers for non-agenda related items. Do we have anybody signed up for that? Yes, we have one submission from the, for that. And um, this submission is from Katie Nunn of Graham. I assume you all are aware of the COVID crisis raging in your county jail at this time. 99 confirmed cases. It is no surprise to me when the head of the sheriff's department, Terry Johnson, does not wear masks or enforce mask wearing upon the deputies. He did not enforce a speedway to comply with the very reasonable and no-brainer COVID prevention mandate. I can only imagine how he is running his jail. With complete disregard of this very real virus and a complete lack of respect for human life, Terry will arrest people for the most minor of offenses, such as profanity, unless you are a white pro-Confederate like Elizabeth Baird, who called a Black Lives Matter protester a B-word on camera right in front of Terry, and he chuckles. I hope you have seen this infamous video. It is very enlightening into the mind of our sheriff. Please consider our demands. Orange County has been able to keep COVID under control by implementing some of these very demands. Some are as simple as having all staff and persons inside to wear a mask at all times and provide regular and frequent cleaning and sanitation of rooms. Also allowing people to keep six feet distance from others and allow newcomers to quarantine for an appropriate amount of time. I have tried to call the jail many times to find out if there are any needs to help the COVID problem or if they will accept donations of masks and sanitizer. Everyone said only Captain Mackey could make such decisions and when I got a hold of him, he said only a new hire, Michelle, could tell us of such things. I still have yet to talk to Michelle. If this is a crisis, why isn't everyone in the jail briefed on needs? This is an emergency. People are getting sick, infecting each other, and possibly dying. These are human beings like you and me, mothers, fathers, daughters, uncles, brothers, sisters. As Gandhi said, the true measure of any society can be found in how it treats its most vulnerable members. It seems the microcosmic society of Graham does not measure up to much. Let's protect our community and each other by putting politics aside and taking COVID-19 seriously and taking care of those who are trapped and at the mercy of the sheriff's administration. Thank you. And that is it, Madam Chair. Okay, thank you. Would it be permissible to allow Ms. Rummer to make a response to that if she's interested? Well, I was going to ask, um, we have Chief Deputy Parker here. Um, I was going to, I mean, we have Commissioner Responses is next. Mm -hmm. I would yield to the health department. So, um, Ms. Rummer, if you want to come up and... Uh, would you want to go with me? Because huh? there's some things I'll defer to you. I mean, Travis says that if you want to go with me, you understand. So um, we've been working really closely with the sheriff's department and trying to make recommendations and make sure um, that they have all the information that would be necessary to try to mitigate the outbreak as quickly as possible. And so they've put a lot of things in place um, and continue to work really hard as far as um, 
providing the the different items for folks and separating people out in cohorts so um, we actually had health department staff go to the jail and walk around with them to figure out how to separate out positive cases um, those that were close contacts and those that tested negative that way that they weren't having that interaction and so I don't know Travis do you have any more to well from the guy from the health department I think we're in a very very good place moving forward uh, you know we can't thank them enough to come in and and just kind of give us the insight and, and what we uh, need to be doing uh, again I think moving forward that, that we're in a really really good place do we have enough protective equipment for staff uh, people in the jail what at, at this point we do uh, I cannot predict the future uh, but right now we do have enough supplies and um, something else to add so the health department is providing weekly testing um, for those that have tested negative previously just in order to make sure that if they do test positive they can be properly separated and so we've worked with the staff at the jail um, in order to talk about symptom checking every day and screening so that those individuals could be separated out if they do um, start showing symptoms that way they're not waiting on the weekly testing and so we're doing that of both inmates and staff now are the inmates wearing masks as well they are given masks uh, and recommended to wear it uh, most of them are wearing them but again uh, you know we do what we can to uh, make them work okay so um i don't want to jump in uh, jump <coughs> jump away <laughs> so help me to understand what was going on before and how things are different now so and how did this uh situation come up 90 people is a lot so how did it come about that the sheriff's department came aware that there so people weren't being tested people weren't being routinely tested when they came into the jail well and i can't explain how it got there but uh it it come and when it when it come in our jail it, it comes strong uh and, and it spread fast uh, i don't think it was uh the symptoms were noticed as probably as it should be uh, i think we have really learned a lot since uh you know this outbreak uh, we're getting every inmate that is booked into our jail now is being tested for covid we're having a weekly test of staff uh, and all the inmates that's in there i've been tested twice myself this past week uh, so again i think it's something that we have all learned from uh, son so what is the turnaround on the testing time because if you're, you're doing an intake on an inmate what, yeah. what's protocol the, do you put the them staff, in quarantine well, till the you staff get the results? in our jail has got uh, very creative and has uh has isolated some areas where they quarantine new inmates that come in until the test uh, returns uh, and the testing has uh, for the most part has been speedy uh, one to two days to get the results back so and I will say um, we were made aware of it when there was two inmates that were transferred to a different facility and they had to be tested upon entry and so that's when we started working together to make sure um, we could figure out how widespread it was and what needed to be done and so I've learned a lot about the jail um, these past couple weeks and they have over a hundred people isn't that what you said a lot of times coming in and out of the facility on any given day and so there's just a lot of movement and to have you know a nine percent community-wide spread with covid it it eventually was going to be in the jail i mean when you think about it that's nine people out of a hundred that would come in that may be asymptomatic or have symptoms um, and so it sounds like north carolina department of corrections has worked through that and figured how to check them before they enter and i guess well, we learned from well it's my understanding that yeah. a, a lot of the uh, the state prisons have uh, rapid testing machines and that's how they test all their inmates coming in uh, we don't have that luxury of, of one of those machines but again uh, we're relying on the health department uh, supplies with all the testing supplies which they have and, and we're going to be 
testing. Maybe our fair governor would push that out to the counties and try to help the counties out a little bit. So people were not being tested when they came to the jail? Screened. 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 They were being screened, not tested. Not tested. Okay, so they were being screened but not tested. So were they getting their temperature taken? Yes. Okay. So how many of the 90 some odd that actually tested positive were actually symptomatic? Do we know that? We, Michelle had that in something. Um, that was I think uh, it was finally determined that uh, it was 53 inmates that uh, were showing some type of symptom uh, when the outbreak occurred. Mm. But none required treatment or hospitalization. Correct. So, unlike uh, some comments that have been made, it wasn't a death trap, right? Mm. Okay. So there, there are some individuals that are inmates that are highly susceptible. Um, and so those people have been identified and um, our staff has been working with the medical staff at the jail to make sure um, that they're monitored daily. So you have 53 people in the jail who are showing symptoms of COVID, but they weren't tested until somebody went to the Department of Corrections and it showed up positive there. And then the people in the jail were all tested and it was revealed that 91-ish inmates and six employees had the virus. Yes. And now you have routine testing of everybody. Right. And if somebody shows symptoms, now you test them. I assume. Please assure me that that is true. That is true. And if somebody was showing symptoms for a staff, and, and really, and what I say showing symptoms of an inmate, uh, I don't know how small the symptoms or what kind of symptoms they were showing. Uh, so it's hard for me to speak to that point. But if, if one of our employees or officers come in and, and didn't meet the screening process, they, they're screened daily before they start work. Uh, if they didn't meet that, uh, that criteria, they're, they were sent home. Um, is there, this is a really important question, is there anything that the Sheriff's Department has requested from county government that they have not received? No, ma'am. Has the county manager and other county employees, have they been um, open and available and receptive to any kind of request for PPE or other support or assistance from the jail? Absolutely. Because um, we've got the CARES Act money. We've got money that we want to spend. We want the jail to be safe for people, for employees and inmates. Yes, and, and that, that's, our, uh, that's our main goal also. Uh, again, I think uh, this incident has, has opened uh, you know, a lot of our eyes, <laughs> and, and, and we want to uh, have a safe facility and, and again we thank the, the health department for coming in and, and, uh, and help. A comment was made about a different piece of equipment at the state prison level versus what we have at the county jail to do testing. It's a rapid test they call is, it. Is, do we know what the cost of that kind of piece of equipment is? So we have actually been looking into what would be required for them to be able to do that if there was a lab certification or something of that nature. Um, we have had trouble figuring out how exactly to acquire that. There's a huge shortage of those machines. And so we've actually been in contact with um, the state epidemiologist and people at DP, um, DHHS in order to try to help us do that um, and get that to them. And so hopefully, we're, we're hoping to get an answer. We, we live in a county with one of the largest lab facilities in the country, LabCorp. You would think maybe they would help donate something. Yeah, so there's actually two FDA-approved um, rapid test uh, kits, and I think that's part of the problem. It's just there's not a lot out there, and they're, they're really hard to get your hands on. So. It's important for us if we can catch them coming in. I mean, that's where you need to stop. Mm -hmm. Well, if we, you say there's a limit on the availability of the equipment to do the rapid testing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and 
one of the questions I had was, do we know what that would cost to buy that equipment? I don't have the cost as far as what the equipment would be and then as far as the um, supplies it would take to be able to run those tests. But that is, it's going to depend on which one we can get and things like that. I would say we need to pursue mm -hmm. investigation into that as a county. And right. We do have funds in the CARE Act. State has funds mm -hmm. in their CARE Act. Maybe they can think about it too. Definitely. Because you're putting people in a confined environment and that's where your spread is. That's where the nursing home issues come. Everybody's together and if we don't know who's got it, I don't know that Amy does. Not, you know, she doesn't know that I don't. That's why we wear protective equipment. But you need to know when they come in, <coughs> hey, I got a special situation. This guy has tested positive. Right, and the um, the state has actually recently provided to long-term care facilities these machines. And so one of our questions on our um, state call last week is, can we look into this for jails? Because I think it's equally as important as a congregate living counties. facility. How many jails do we have in the state? I mean, the state needs to be on top of something one, once in a while, too. That's a good point. <clears throat> All right, um, do we have other, do we have anybody, any more questions for them on that topic? And so then other, well, that's the only call that we had. So I guess there's no other commission responses to the public comment. Um, we have a county manager report. Uh, we do, commissioners. I'd like to take this opportunity to bring you up to date on our sales tax revenue. I indicated when we did the budget this year that I keep the board posted on how sales tax revenue is coming in. We have received our numbers for the month of June uh, of 2020. So for the COVID months that uh, we've been tracking, we've included March, April, May, and June as months that uh, COVID has affected our economy. Uh, for the period March, April, May, and June of 2020, our sales tax revenue is 1.81% higher than our sales tax revenue the same period in 2019. That's pretty amazing, great it's pretty news. Uh, great news. Uh, one really astounding fact, these June numbers, uh, June 2020, we're looking at a 17.48% increase in the uh, amount of revenue versus June 19. So that, that is a, a tremendous uh, shot, frankly. Uh, it's a lot more revenue than we imagined we would be bringing in this time this year. It's good news. I think uh, we want to continue to track it and make sure it's not some kind of an anomaly. Uh, but if sales tax revenue continues to come in on this trajectory, I'll be looking at probably in October bringing you some recommendations about uh, things that we didn't include in this year's budget that we should uh, that we should certainly include. So um, we can only uh, attribute that to our strong economy here in Alamance County. The fact that uh, people have continued to shop apparently from home uh, through the shutdown months. Uh, so it's you it's good news. Find that. Everybody's out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So at this point, it's very good news for sales tax revenue, and we'll we'll like to have at least one more month under our belt uh, of actual numbers before we start bringing you things to consider to reinstate. So, well, with 2.5 openings last Friday, it only should get better instead of worse. So, yes. and that's all. Stores are out of stuff. They <laughs> sell more to get. Right. Do we have any commissioner comments? Nope. Um, my only comment, um, Mr. Haygood, I would just really ask that you continue to work diligently with the Sheriff's Department and the Detention Center and making sure that they have the things that they need to keep the inmates and the employees of the Detention Center safe. Um, the situation in the jail is very concerning to me. The virus is, I mean, look at what our children are having to go through with having to do school from home in front of the computer for hours a day. You've got, I've talked to business owners who, you know, are losing their livelihood, everything that they've worked for for years because of the virus. And um, a coordinated response by, um, especially by uh, confined congregate living situations like nursing homes and uh, corrections facilities in the jails is really, really important. And so I just want to be sure the county government is doing everything that we can to meet the needs 
of the detention center and the greater community so we can finally get rid of this virus mm -hmm. and go get back, back to, to living life the way it's meant to be lived. We will certainly do that and I've appreciated uh, the open communication with the Sheriff's Department and the uh, Health Department also, but uh, we'll continue to work with them, make sure we can do whatever we can do to provide them the, the support, financial material that they need. And um, Mr. Hamey and Chief Parker and uh, Ms. Rummer, if there's anything that you need that you're not getting, please let me know. Y'all have my number. Let me know because I want to get you the resources that you require because it's, it's important. We got to get rid of this virus. I don't like wearing this mask. I know nobody else does, you know? <laughs> Had enough of it, you know? And I know that, like I said, the children here are having to go through virtual learning for the school. It's ridiculous. The whole thing. I think we're all over it. So let's just do what we got to do to get rid of it. Well, I'd like to commend our health department and Ms. Rimmer for an excellent job of jumping on this with the sheriff's office. I mean, I was notified that night of what was going on. I serve on the health department board, so I was notified immediately and uh, kept in, kept included. And uh, it's it's critical that we take care of these people. They are in a confined environment. I agree with everything Amy just said. That uh, we definitely need to make sure that you get the resources you need to protect everybody. And I will also say, after having spent a weekend trying to get ready for a youngster, where one of our grandchildren is, uh, when he's at, at, at home school, is with us. And uh, it's a doggone nightmare to try and get all this stuff working and get it working on your computer and then get it working so that they can network, so they can, I don't know how anybody in an area of the county that doesn't have Wi-Fi access can get this job done. But we that's, that's another issue we really need to try and work on from the county's perspective. One of the things I'd like to see us do going forward is come up with some way to improve the uh, Wi-Fi access. I mean, it's those of us who have rapid Wi-Fi, high-speed Wi-Fi, know how important it is. But even with it, it can be difficult. But with with it with an infrequent or irregular access to it, it must be even more of a nightmare for a parent mm -hmm. to try and navigate this process for their children who are working trying to learn from home. So It is a nightmare all day, every day. That's what I live with out in the country. And it's horrible, and I'm tired of that too. <laughs> I've um, been on the phone with you, and I know you it's walk terrible. Everybody's trying to have a right post, don't you? I have to pretty much stand in the pasture with the cows to get a decent <laughs> signal, and um, <laughs> got the chigger bites to prove it. Know, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. But uh, yeah, these children—they have the little ones, preschool, and then um, the kindergarten, first, second graders. They have a defined window of opportunity of brain development to learn certain skills. And a lot of those skills are dependent on in-person instruction. And I'm just horrified at the long-term damage that's being done to our little ones because of um, online learning and the expectations that are being put on them. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not blaming anybody because, mm -hmm. you know, the school system's doing the best that they can. I, that's not. This is not how they want to do no. their business. You know, this is not what they've chosen. But it's where they are, and they're doing the best they can with it. I'm not trying to point fingers or blame anybody, but the fact is, we got a bad situation for these little ones, and um, we got to make sure that we all do what we can to try to take personal responsibility and get rid of the virus, so that we can all go back to living life the way it's meant to be lived. Miss Rimmer, thank you very much for jumping in there. Stacy kind of just jumped out and what a time to come in to take over a health department in something like we're going through right now. But you've done a good job. I, I see the Absolutely. results already. All right, well, if uh, all the business being concluded, we'll be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. 
Typically, the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.